Hello, everybody, and good morning. My name is Tamsin Rose, and I will be your moderator this morning. And we're going to explore the way forward, plastics in a circular economy. The way that this works, as many of you are watching us on Zoom, and we will have opportunities for you to engage. How you do this is you raise your virtual hand, and you can put your comments and your questions in the chat. And in the next hour together, we will be giving you an opportunity to come in and share your ideas and your thoughts. The hashtag for today is FOE debate, and you can see that on the screen behind me. We look forward to hearing your views and your comments. So let me just give you a sense of perspective. We are the third planet from the sun in a universe that has existed for billions of years. And yet, we live in a plastic world. For most of us alive today, our first exposure to plastic was in utero before we were born. And every single day since we've been born, We've been exposed to more. We've ingested it, we've touched it, we've used it. Our entire world is surrounded by it. And it's convenient, it's helpful, it's cheap, it's useful. But we're now starting to understand the long-term and the short-term impact of our plastic world. So the way forward isn't as simple as just looking at plastic. It's part of a broader conversation about the way that we live our lives together. It's the way that we consume. It's the way our economic models have been developed. And today we're going to be focusing in the circular economy, how this rethinking about the way that we produce, consume and live, starting with plastic as part of the bigger shift that we need. Because the countdown to climate change and to a world that is unlivable for human and animal life is continuing and the clock is ticking louder and louder. We need change and we need it now. The last 12 months with the pandemic has brought home to us our shared vulnerability. It has also brought home to us how our global supply chains impact on the way that we live. It's also been a, a moment of reflection because we've put pause on everything. So it's a time to reconfigure, to rethink, and look again at what it is that we do in the way that we live, work, pursue, consume, and pursue our lives. So today, this is a moment looking forward because there will be a time post the pandemic. We're talking about the green recovery. Our economies have been through a seismic shock. The decisions we make now about how we put a new path forward will be critically important to the future. So today, we're going to be exploring this. And I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker this morning, Hans Brunings, the Executive Director for the European Environment Agency. And he's going to share with us a new report looking at the impact of plastics and how we can use this as our stepping stone towards a green circular economy. Hans, welcome. Please share your screen and your report with us. I will uh, share the screen. Uh, am I? Are you seeing my screen now? We can see your screen. Okay, that is uh, wonderful. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to launch a new European Environment Agency report on plastics, the circular economy, and Europe's environment. And as has been said in the introduction, I think the report is timely and touches not in a narrow sense on the issue of plastics, but places it in a broader uh, perspective. So what I would like to do is dive straight into the report and explain a bit to you what the type of knowledge is that we bring to the table of the policymakers in this report. Many people focus uh, on plastics as a waste issue, but if you look at the whole production use and then end uh, of life cycle of plastics, it is clear that we have environmental and climate impacts throughout the life cycle, from the extraction of fossil fuels, which are the basis of plastics, greenhouse gases and pollutants are emitted during that stage and the production stage. Then, of course, we are exposed to uh, a number of toxic substances, uh, potentially during the use of plastics, whether it is in construction, whether it is in uh, the cars that are built with uh, several types of plastics or in packaging, and those are the three biggest uses of plastics. And then in the after use, where litter is an issue, but also landfill and incineration of litter is an issue that produces environmental and climate uh, impacts. 
One of the challenges with plastics in the circular economy is that it has a number of characteristics that make it particularly difficult at this moment to bring it fully in a circular economy logic. First of all, you've got the single use or short life design of many plastic uh, products made of plastic. Then you've got the issue of uh, addition of additives, which make them more hazardous and also more difficult uh, to keep in a circular economic logic. And then there's the leakage to the environment, which is often persistent, hazardous, and on top of that, accumulating over time. We see relatively low recycling uh, rates, a low share of recycled plastics that are uh, put into new products. And all of this is mainly derived from fossil fuels. So this is a challenge for a circular economy perspective uh, on plastics. Now, plastics have only been with us for about 60, 70 years, but we see an increase in the use of plastics. In fact, if we continue to increase our use and production of plastics as we do now, by 2050, 20% 20 of the world's greenhouse gas emissions will come from plastics. But we see a shift in this production, more to uh, China and the rest of Asia, and the relative share of Europe has slowly declined. But overall, we see an increase in the production. When we talk about plastics uh, production, uh, it is the part of the economy or the sector of the economy that uh, uses, when we look at materials, most uh, energy and the chemical sector. And if we look within the chemical sector, plastics is a significant part of that. And if we look at direct emissions, uh, it, is, it is a very significant part of uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, not only in Europe, but also uh, globally, with 132 million tons in 2018. So uh, it's not only waste, it's greenhouse gas emissions and a number of other elements. Now, this is a staggering uh, graph. If you look at the waste that uh, plastics has generated, we know that about 8 billion tons of plastic have been produced since the beginning, since the 1950s. And by 2015, uh, 6.3 billion tons of those have become waste. And the plastic that was still in use has a large proportion of it that will become waste. So we're not doing well when it comes to uh, to recycling and to keeping plastics in uh, the cycle. Uh, and that, that will only increase by 2050 to an estimate that uh, 25 billion tons if we continue with business as usual. Now, this plastic waste for the EU has been an issue. And uh, the way to deal with it, uh, to a large extent, had been to export it. But then we all remember that in 2017, China and a number of other countries has, uh, have pretty much uh, put a ban on importing plastic waste from Europe. So we see more plastic staying in the EU uh, since primarily 2018, but also a shift to other countries. Turkey, Malaysia are now importing more uh, plastic from Europe, but we are also now stuck with our own waste and we need to do something with it, hence the importance of a different perspective. Now, that perspective is, of course, more circularity and more sustainability. And if you look at the production steps uh, and then the use and the waste, there are pathways to get to getting there. And one pathway is, I think, uh, very essential. That is smarter use, which means using less plastic, using uh, less plastic when we use it by, by doing it in a more rational way, uh, and then also increasing the circularity, which goes back to uh, the whole system that is required for circularity. It's not just better collection. And the renewable materials, uh, making plastics uh, from molecules that have different characteristics. And that's where I think that the chemical strategy is very important if we think of plastics, because the mantra of the new chemical strategy is safe and sustainable by design. So more sustainable feedstock, more sustainable molecules could really reduce the impact on climate, could reduce the leakage, pollution to air and water, and of course also toxicity uh, to humans and nature. Now it has already been mentioned there is more attention to plastics in the COVID-19 
crisis because of the protective equipment that is made of plastic, but also the fall in global oil prices during this crisis has put uh, uh, has given a hit on the the plastics recycling market. So we see the complexity of these production and consumption systems and how things hang uh, together. Of course, we also uh, know that quite a bit of the plastic waste has ended up in landfills and incineration plants. And that is the, the good uh, option almost at this moment, because a lot of it ended up in the sea and in nature as well. And that is, of course, not where we want to see it. Now, the road ahead to circular plastics economy, I think, is focusing and bringing the plastics regime, the plastic system in line with climate neutrality strong biodiversity targets and zero pollution. Those are the overarching goals of the European Green Deal. That means that we need to have policies towards circular plastics, and I mentioned a number of the issues there. We also will need business models that are adapted to that, that run through the value chain. And we should not forget the role of consumers, of course. We make choices also as individual consumers. So those are the core elements in a nutshell. I would like to mention in the last minute that we are also um, launching two briefings today uh, along with the report. One is plastics in textiles. Uh, um, this is an important element and the, the EU is focusing on textiles as a core sector, uh, which I think is a really good uh, thing also uh, for plastics. And we are also uh, launching a briefing on uh, enabling circular business models for that type of uh, new plastics regime. So with those three, we think that we are contributing to a discussion on the circular economy, but we're framing it in a larger perspective than just focusing on waste and what we can do with waste. Thank you and happy to uh, be part of uh, any questions or debate afterwards. Thank you very much, Hans. And of course, we will put links in the chat to the report that you've launched, which is on your website and these briefings. And participants can go to your, the website of the European Environment Agency and also find them themselves uh, and, and be, have a chance to look in more details. I'm going to now pass to uh, Maria Spiraki from the European Parliament to ask a question. And after that, I'll be opening the floor to the audience where I'll ask you to raise your virtual hand and you can put your question in the chat. So be, be ready for that. And I'm sure you'll have some questions here. Um, Maria, let me now look from a European perspective. Our efforts for a green recovery as a result of the pandemic, are focusing on shifting our economy from linear to circular patterns. So far, so good. And plastics are a central starting point for this shift. But the transition will impact different countries in Europe differently. Some will, of course, have a much greater hit on their economies than others. So what can the EU do to support all countries in making this big shift? Maria. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you very much for the presentation of very interesting report on behalf of European Environment Agency. I would like to focus on three aspects I think that we have to do more. The first one is investments. According to, to the recent report of the European Court of Editors, only 1 billion out of 4.4 billion allocated for the period 2014-2020 in the EU spent it by the end of 2019 for waste management. So we have a lack of investments and we don't use the existing uh, financial instruments in order to increase investments, not only in waste management, but also in facilitating the industry and the companies to transform themselves from, from using and producing single-use plastics into uh, uh, recyclable plastics and bio biodegradable plastics. The second one is how can we use the, 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 the legislation, the legislative uh, power that we have? Well, we need to update the legislation, and at the same time, we have to monitor the existing legislation. As maybe you are all familiar, about one third of EU's reported plastic packaging recycling rate is achieved through shipments to non EU countries for recycling. And by the, the beginning of this year, the Commission has banned uh, this procedure. So it is, it is important to have a strong monitoring process. And it is also important 
to to use our powerful tools like like the the, the, the tax system that we have. For example, uh, we have to to lower labor and capital tax in, in taxes in favor of environmental taxation. And maybe in, in this regard, we can create uh, some kind of incentives. We have also to go ahead with mandatory uh, extended producer responsibility schemes. Uh, concerning different types of plastics in order to have enough quantity of plastic weights for for finally uh, for finally achieve to have uh, a allow me to say profitable activity for recycling plastics and the third aspect that i would like to focus on is the way that we will engage people by educating people by by finally creating a new model of consumer and consumers are are very very sensitive in this regard and uh, we can play a huge role by by initiating uh, specific campaigns, by also engaging students. And this was my focus during my last campaign uh, under the topic fish or plastic. I engaged a lot of schools in Greece, and I think that their response finally rewards me. Once again, thank you very much, and I am at your disposal for any further questions. Thank you very much, Maria, and uh, useful to get some, some of your views on what it is you think we could move forward. And I, I note that e even the instruments that we have aren't being necessarily effectively used. So it's not, not a question of saying we need to have more money to do things. We have capacities, but we're not necessarily targeting them. So now I'm going to open the floor for interventions and questions and comments. If you could raise your virtual hand, and I hope we'll be able to get through as, through as many questions as we can. Our first question, we're going to invite Pascaline. If you would like to um, share your, your screen, or if you'd like to just open your mic. Pascaline. Go ahead. What's Thank your you. Question? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very interesting presentation, a very interesting debate. Uh, my name is Pascal Ngabori. I'm, I'm from Pilot for Dev, which is an NGO working, uh, for instance, on the restoration of marine ecosystems among others and on climate change. And my question is about international cooperation. Uh, how are we uh, helping other countries to tackle this uh, huge problem, which is plastics? Um, we are just now getting aware of other problems such as microplastics, as you said, in textiles, which are also polluting water and having impacts on, uh, on uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, and there are already initiatives uh, for circular economy, uh, even in uh, third countries, but the, the problem is uh, to find funding and to scale up. Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you. So we'll take that question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start by uh, passing that to Hans. What are we doing to help other countries? You showed a graph there which showed that, you know, the, the numbers of use in Europe of plastic is starting to come down slowly and we could do more, but it's other countries in the world where you could see a sharp increase. And, and, and yet some of those countries, like China, have made big global climate commitments to go climate neutrality. If, if as, as you've proposed, that the plastics needs to get brought into more strongly into approaches to climate neutrality, do you see that supporting other countries around the world? Well, yeah, I think part of the solution is to go to the very fundamentals and the fundamentals are, uh, are a chemical sector that uh, will have to go through a serious transition if it wants to be in line with uh, the Paris Agreement, if it wants to be in line with biodiversity objectives, uh, but also with a number of health objectives. So going to a safe uh, and sustainable by design uh, chemicals is, is a starting point. And this will not only be something for Europe. Yeah? A second element is, of course, that there are more and more uh, international agreements like the Basel Convention that do no longer allow for uh, the export of certain uh, waste flows. Uh, and and that, that will have an impact, I think, also on other regions uh, from a European perspective. And a third element, of course, is that more and more global value chains, production and consumption value chains, are indeed global. So uh, extended producer responsibility schemes we should start to think about those more and more at a global level. Uh, and that is in line with the statements that are made by the sector. Uh, all of the big companies have a vice president for sustainability and they all have a set of standards. Well, they, they have to be taken uh, seriously, uh, not only in places where there is stronger enforcement and legislation like Europe and some other places, but also uh, 
across the globe. So holding them accountable for their global value and production chains, I think is part of the extended thinking about extended producer responsibility. And those are some of the elements that, that uh, I would uh, put on the table. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be bringing Sander in in a minute as a speaker, but before you come in with that, is there anything, you, you're from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is obviously looking at this issue of circular economy. Is, is there anything you can tell us about this, you know, the fact that it's, it's a global effort, global supply chains, and many developing countries are going to need financial support and investment to help them move away from a process where they are recipient and processor of much of our waste to another mechanism? Sandra. Yeah, I think for, for me this, this links a lot to the ongoing debate around putting in place a global treaty on, on plastics. Um, so we, we see today that, that there's front-running businesses and governments around the world that are acting. Um, but if you want to solve this issue and look at the vast and global scale of this issue, we need everyone to act. And a global treaty uh, on plastics could really be a great opportunity to set one common kind of direction globally, but, but can also include many other elements, including support mechanisms for, um, you know, for, for the countries that, that need most support um, or sharing of best practices. And, and you know, want to also highlight extended producer responsibility here that, that Hans just mentioned. Um, you know, we're, we're working on, on, on a piece of, of work here and, and it's kind of increasingly clear that without extended producer responsibility schemes, the economics of recycling simply don't stack up. Collecting, sorting, recycling plastics is more expensive than producing virgin plastics. And globally, that's an economic gap of $30 billion annually, uh, that is, uh, that we need to close. And, and in theory, that money can come from many places. But in practice, EPR is the only proven way to actually make the economics work. So, so without rolling out EPR globally, and um, we don't see how global recycling rates for, for plastic packaging would ever meaningfully increase. And so okay. I think that's an, an, an one important aspect of that as well. Thank you. We have a couple more people who've raised their hands, and I'll get through as many questions as we can in the time. First of all, I'd like to pass the floor to Doreen. Doreen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question. From Can Europe, thanks. hello. Yes, hello. So um, thanks, everybody. And thank you, Hans, for uh, another interesting presentation. Um, I work on industrial transformation for uh, the organization Climate Action Network. Um, and I have an unusual uh, position in the organization because what I'm trying to do is strongly marry the climate and the biodiversity and pollution uh, agendas together. And I very much hear a lot of that coming through uh, this presentation and uh, the study. Uh, my focus uh, really is uh, on chemicals as uh, an energy intensive industry. And we know that the drive, especially through a key uh, element of the European Green Deal is the industrial strategy. And the drive there, the focus is very narrowly on climate neutrality. And so the, the industry is pushing for fuel shifts, for climate, uh, for carbon capture and storage and use, and especially for chemical recycling. So I think when you talk about the renewable uh, molecules, there is a push for what is called renewable carbon. So I think the, where, I'm, where I'm feeling like the opportunities are this year is in the updated industrial strategy to come. Okay. where we as an organization are very much pushing for looking beyond those fuel switches. But the other one is the Sustainable Products Initiative, because okay. we need those product requirements that also focus on plastics to take the plastic strategy forward. So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mira, I might come to you on this, because um, there we've spoken about the extended producer uh, responsibility. This is a legislation. We've talked about the Renewable Products Initiative. W where do you see any industrial strategy? These are the core pieces of work where the EU could influence some of these issues. Maria, would you like to comment on that? You need to unmute. Sorry. 
Well, thank you once again. Well, I would like to say some a few things on under my capacity as one of the authors of the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability Motion for a Resolution on behalf of the Parliament. First of all, I would like to say that it is important to insist on chemicals, uh, on sustainable chemicals by design, but at the same time we have to take into account that we are talking about the global market and we have to, to insist also on establishing a global level paid field. Uh, talking about chemicals that we are export and chemicals that we are importing the EU, including the, the basic ingredients that we use for plastic. Uh, having said that, it is it is also the, the energy transformation of the chemical industry and also the plastic industry that we have to take into account. And in this regard, I, I would like to say that one I'm one of the strongest supporters of, 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 the, of the use of CCS and CCU in our technology in order to use all the available technology for transforming our industry into more green and finally into green and carbon neutral. And in this regard, I think that we, we have to, to, to organize our, our industry in order to, to achieve our mid-target and our, and our final target with zero emissions, zero to emission by 2050, by using all, by, but all the available technological and financial instruments. It is very important for me to understand that it's not something that we have to put on the paper. It's not only a piece of legislation, it is a reality that we have to focus, and it is a, rea it's a reality that we have to support and transform by, by, by the end of the day. Thank you. Okay, um, oh, I have a couple more hands up, and I'm going to encourage members of the business community who are watching this, because we've been talking here about market models. We've been talking about the fact that the price of oil went down, which had a huge, it meant that the business model for recyclable plastic essentially was harmed. So let's hear from members of the business community, you know, well, how much of this is connected to global commodities markets, which are very volatile, you know, how do we plan and invest for a system where, you know, the whole model might be destroyed by a change in price of oil? And as we look at the price of oil over the last 30 or 40 years, we've had huge periods when it's been very volatile. So does it make sense to have a strategy on how we deal with plastic be based on the economics of the market? That, that's a question. And uh, if you're from the business community, please signal to us in the chat so we can invite you to come in. What, I'm going to uh, get the next person to unmute themselves. That's Mira. Mira, would you like to unmute and uh, share your question? Mira, I can't hear you. Nope, still no sound, and yet you don't seem to be muted. Better now? Better. Lovely. Okay, sorry for this. Um, I might not exactly represent the business community here, but coming from GRZ, GRZ, the German Development Agency, I also wanted to point out that on behalf of the German government, we have implemented and set up the Prevent Waste Alliance, which is bringing together more than 170 organizations from the public as well as private sector, from academia and civil society. And they together are working on trying to prevent waste and um, close the loops for e-waste and plastic waste as well. We have um, published a toolbox on extended producer responsibility because we also see it as a main tool to help other governments and finance their sustainable waste management. But also we have to think of um, more ways to try and prevent waste and actually create a market for these recycled plastic materials. So maybe eco-modulated fees where producers that actually produce easier to recyclable plastic materials pay less. So there's an incentive to actually change the design at the very beginning of the life cycle. Great. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. And I, I'm going to bring in, because we have David from the business sector from, I think, Plastics Europe, who's offered to come in. I, I issued a challenge out to the business community to say, okay, this is, you know, how do we address this? Um, it, a lot of the viability of the changes that we're talking about are linked to our business models, and those are affected by very volatile markets. So, David, what can you share with us? You need to unmute and, and respond on some of these yeah, challenges. So, so so thanks very much for this, this very interesting debate. I was listening into Hans's intervention where he said the chemical sector will have to go through a very serious transition. And I just want to reassure everybody that we know that. Um, we support the, 
uh, Commission's 2050 climate goals, we're one of the first sectors to face the challenge of circular economy. And it does take time. We do need sometimes space to do it and not constant bans. But, you know, our industry is fundamentally changing um, with lots of different projects, new innovations that are sent to me every day whether it be in recycling, whether it be in using things like CO2 to produce new plastics, which is at, at an early stage, or renewable raw materials. We know that we cannot continue with some of the figures that were shown in, in Hans's slides, um, but we also would question that do they really take into account the efforts that our industry has committed to make or is committing to on a daily basis, whether it be on the climate side, whether it be on the uptake of raw materials or whether it be on the, the renewables. Just looking in the chat, and, and Sander made the very valid point about EPR, and he also made the point about the business community supporting Global Plastics Agreement, which is something that we do, something that we're very heavily engaged with the Commission in. And EPR is potentially one of those ways to solve that, that cost. Together with lots of other things, it won't be a, a silver bullet, but together with perhaps um, a mix of legislation and system change, including better design plastics. Um, but we're certainly going um, for that model. The final thing that I would like to say is that what we really need for this to happen is a strong single market. Um, we see at the moment a situation where governments are going in all sorts of different directions on plastics. And they may rightly and understandably feel that they're doing that to uh, protect uh, the environment. but. The only outcome of that for us and, and the, the biggest opportunity for industry in Europe to move to a sustainable business model when it comes to plastics is the EU single market. The fact that we can launch a new product and immediately have access to 450 million consumers. So really important for us to do that. What we also need in Europe for this real transition and transformational change is a single market for plastic waste. We need waste to be able to move easily from one country to another. And it's something that we're finding getting more difficult rather than rather than easier. So it's something that we, we really need. I just wanted to stress that point. Okay, lovely. Thank you, David. And, and, and this is very useful to have your input because it would be, um, and you were, uh, let's just clarify for people, you work for Plastics Europe, which is a trade association. Is that correct, David? Yes, it's the trade association of, of plastics producers. So. Yeah. My members make the raw materials which go into to plastics products, not only packaging, but lots of much more durable applications as well. Thank you for that, David. I'm now going to move on to our next speakers. I'm going to bring in Sander Defrut, who's the lead for the New Plastics Economy Initiative at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And of course, your foundation has been a driving force in the transition to a circular economy for many years. Um, what's your take on how far we've got on plastics and what needs to happen next to start driving through these big transitional changes. Sander. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the, the good starting points is, is that by now, everyone really agrees that we have a vast and truly global issue with, with plastic waste and pollution. We also um, start to have a critical mass of front running businesses, governments, and, and even investors um, that uh, are realizing that and that also realize that while we have an issue with plastic waste, that the solution is not just in better waste management or better recycling. Um, the problem is much more systemic and th therefore the solutions will be much more systemic. Our entire econ economic system is linear and wasteful by design and therefore we need to fundamentally rethink that system and we need a comprehensive circular economy approach to do that, that starts by rethinking what we're putting on the market in the first place, eliminating all the plastics that we don't need, innovating all the plastics that we do need, making sure they're all reusable, recyclable, or compostable, and at the same time ensure that we have the capabilities to also circulate the plastics that we use to keep them in our economy and out of the environment, landfills, and incinerators. And I mentioned that a critical mass of front-running businesses and governments um, are realizing that, and that's illustrated through the global commitment and the plastic pacts around the world, where now more than a thousand organizations have explicitly united behind that common vision of a circular economy for plastics and behind concrete 2025 targets to also help realize that vision. 
So now it's really the time to deliver on these targets and, and make that vision a reality. And the progress reports of the global commitment and as well as the various plastic packs started to show initial progress. But equally, if you put that progress in perspective of the vast scale of the issue that we're facing, it's very clear that much more needs to be done and at a much higher pace. And I'd like to, in particular, call out a few things. I mean, first of all, we need to see much, much, much more efforts going into upstream solutions, solutions that go beyond recycling, solutions that rethink the way we deliver products and goods and value to consumers, solutions that reduce the need for single-use packaging in the first place. And we've recently published an upstream innovation guide that has over 100 case examples just illustrating the vast amount of innovation opportunities in that space. Um, secondly, um, I'd, I'd like to um, call out a few of the, the, the plastic packaging types that are not recyclable today, where we need to really ask some fundamental questions. And you know, one example is, is the small sized flexible packages. We, we need to really ask the question, collectively ask the question, do we have a credible roadmap to make recycling work in any reasonable time frame for these packaging types? And if the answer is yes, then we need to see collective and bold action to put that roadmap into practice. And if the answer is no, we need to see equally bold action to innovate away from these packaging types altogether. But we need to ask that question. Um, and then finally, um, coming back to, to what I raised earlier, um, it's crucial to have that critical mass of stakeholders um, that, that are stepping up as, as front-running businesses and governments. But to solve this problem, we need everyone to act, and everyone to act in a concerted way. And, and that's where a, a mechanism like a global treaty on plastic pollution um, could really help, not as a replacement of voluntary action, but as a complement um, to it. And there's a lot of momentum now. Uh, Two-thirds of UN member states have either explicitly called for it or expressed their um, support for exploring the solution. Um, and also in the business community, we've recently launched a manifesto where um, uh, a couple of dozen of major businesses um, have called for such a treaty as well. So the momentum is there. The resolution is being worked on. Uh, so this is really an opportunity that we simply cannot afford to miss. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So clearly there's, there's global movement. Uh, you've highlighted for us a couple of critical issues where we still don't have an idea of where we're going and what we need to do about that. Um, let me now pass to you our last speaker of this morning, and that's Sarah Nel Nellen from the Deputy Head of Cabinet for the European Commission's Vice President, uh, Franz Timmermans. A question here is, okay, good news, the ban on single-use plastics takes effect this year, which is fantastic. So what's our next big ambitious target? that we should be aiming for at EU level. We've heard this big message about a treaty, a global treaty. We've had other people talk about the EPR. We've talked about financial incentives. Lots of ideas here. But what's the view from the Berlimont, from the headquarters of the Commission? Thank you. Um, good morning to all. Well, uh, I would like to start before answering the question on the next challenges, a little um, addition to what you say, well, we have now the ban in place. I would like to underline that what the Commission did with the single use plastic directive is much more than the visibility that the ban of some products got. It was really a um, wider approach to a number of the single use uh, products uh, that were at the time part of our studies of most found items and a little bracket if we would recount today probably the masks the uh, single-use masks would be part of it and cause a lot of uh, problem but with the legislation we have there's also reduction targets for instance for cups and containers there are design requirements you're if you still buy and don't drink uh, tap water, but you buy a, um, a single-use uh, bottle with water, the little cap will be tethered and attached to it in a few years. Um, the bottle will have in 25, uh, mandatory 25% recycled content. Um, for consumers, we have under the single-use uh, plastic directive, um, there will be labels uh, on which products contain plastic. Um, and for instance, tobacco, the cigarettes are part of that. Consumers will see in a few years time and we're working on the labels uh, to be uh, put on the packages that also those tobacco products contain plastic and therefore should not be thrown away in the streets like 
where we have counted them. Um, extended producer responsibility is part of the legislation we have. So for the single use products that are part of it, um, producers will have to pay for um, the uh, waste management cost or um, the collection costs um, that uh, are currently there. So just wanted to put that in the broader perspective because I know that all the attention goes to bans, but that's just one article in the legislation, gets a lot of visibility there, but there is much more. And of course, in the next years, we want to build on more. Um, the Green Deal and uh, the circular, new circular economy action plan that was adopted just before the lockdown, lockdown last year in March uh, 2020, uh, builds on the uh, plastic strategy uh, of the Commission and highlights uh, further actions that will come. And I'll just mention a few. I think one important one is uh, action around um, microplastics. Um, there are normally next year restrictions uh, via the um, uh, chemicals agency uh, will come into place. Um, and it's about microplastics uh, from, uh, un in or from um, um, intentionally added uh, in intentionally added uh, products such as um, cosmetics, detergents and paints. So that's uh, upcoming uh, measures at European level. But of course, a majority is from unintentional releases such as uh, from um, tires, textiles, and there as well, uh, work is ongoing to act on that front. Besides the micro plastics issue, um, there will be also, and that's important, I think, in the thinking and the shift that has been made in this Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan to move up what we call the waste uh, hierarchy. Uh, we have legislation in place already to deal with end of life. Um, for instance, we have um, a target for the recycling uh, of um, plastic uh, packaging, um, knowing that Packaging is accounting for 40% of uh, the plastic use. Um, but we want to do more because we are very much aware that we are not going to recycle ourselves out of the problems. Uh, while all of this is very important, it's recycled content is probably the best alternative feedstock we have for now. But and the figures that uh, Jan, uh, that um, that Hans has shown, uh, look also or point at the um, production of plastics that will uh, double in the next 20 years, etc. So reducing and having durable products is one of our uh, focus area as well. And okay. with the sustainable product initiative, this will be part of it. Um, so that's a few of the challenges ahead and the ambitions we have. And if I may ask, add a last one, because Sander uh, indeed uh, underlined it, the global action is a priority for the EU as well. And we are absolutely in touch with the new Biden administration to find support for global action on marine pollution and plastic. So that is definitely one of our ambitions as well. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, for giving us a, a highlight and, and just giving us a little bit more nuance in the different ways that the EU can act. And BANS is just one of the tools and the kit that would look at a range of different issues. I'm now going to open the floor for the next 10 minutes or so. So please feel free to let us know in the chat by raising your hand or letting us know you want to speak. I know we've got several people already lined up to speak, so thank you. I'm going to start by Wouter. Wouter Vermeulen, would you like to unmute yourself and put your input and then we'll be coming to others. Wouter. Sure, thanks. Good morning. I'm uh, Wouter Vermeulen with uh, the Coca-Cola Company leading our public policy uh, engagement here in Europe. Thanks for the very interesting debate. There are many angles that I'd love to uh, debate a bit further, but I'll, I'll try to focus on on one uh, specifically, and this is a question for uh, for Sarah Nalen, actually. So first of all, let's, let's remind you all that we're not in the business of packaging or, or plastics, we're in the business of great tasting beverages, right? And so we want to use either no packaging or less packaging or better packaging. And if we look at better packaging for us, that would mean packaging and plastic packaging that is cut free from virgin oil base. So we are aspiring for all of our plastic beverages, uh, plastic packaging rather, to come in 100% RPET, 100% recycled PET, no virgin oil used anymore. 
in order to do that, obviously, that means massive investments, both in collection infrastructure, where we support well design deposit return schemes, as well as in recycling infrastructure, meaning long term security, long term stability. So my question to you, Sarah, and maybe also to Sander is, to what extent do you see 100% RPET as 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 a important tool and does 100% RPET have a place in a circular economy in Europe? Because if we're confronted with the debates that we currently see in certain member states of banning these 100% RPET, Hello? then I do think we won't be able to attain those long-term targets. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Sakran, bleiben Sie dran, weil ich in einem Meeting bin, dann muss ich mich da erstmal ausklicken. Sorry, somebody you needs to mute their mic. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to come back to you, Sarah, gut, and ich Sie zurück, ne? in um, also to okay. um, Sand, if you want to briefly answer that question, you know, is there a view for RPET? And if so, what are we doing to, you know, 100% recyclable uh, RPET? Sarah, and then perhaps Sanda, you also might want to say something on that? Well, uh, at the European level, as I mentioned, uh, what we have put in the single-use plastic uh, legislation is already um, uh, a minimum goal of 25% uh, uh, recycled uh, PET by 25 and uh, for all bottles uh, a 30% target in 2030. So it's clearly part of our toolbox. Uh, we, uh, we pay a lot of attention to, uh, as I mentioned, the use of secondary raw materials as they are a very good alternative feedstock. We produce things, let's not just uh, uh, landfill, burn, and uh, not use them again. Let's keep them in our economy. Let, let's keep them going. So, yes, this is part of the toolbox, but as mentioned as well, it's not the solution or the solution for all our problems either. We need to look beyond it. We need to look at other solutions, at, um, yeah, people uh, bringing uh, their own bottles on the go, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also looking at, um, well, what we transport often in beverages is a lot of water. Are there solutions with syrups? Are there solutions with which go beyond and which go into the way of thinking that Sander has laid out, a systematic rethinking? And that should be also part of our toolbox at European level. Okay. Thank you. I know we've got lots of comments coming in the chat about the issue about uh, our pet and pet recycling, etc., and the question of chemicals that exist in um, uh, package recycling. Lissandra, do you want to add anything on what we just said? Because you, you were referenced that it's, it's this new thinking about where we might go. It isn't just replace one plastic with another. It's a bigger picture issue. Sander. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the overall um, uh, objectives of the circular economy or, or consequence of a circular economy is uh, a decoupling from fossil fuel feedstocks. But it's important to, to do that in the right way. And that is first and foremost, eliminate all the packaging that we don't need. Um, and, and there's a lot of examples of that. I mean, um, Walter, your, your competitor, uh, PepsiCo, has, has SodaStream completely rethinking the business model and delivering the beverages or the you know the great taste as you as you called it to consumers in a completely different way. When we do need packaging, focusing on reusable packaging, and that's where um, your own company Coke has has done great work in countries like Brazil and Latin America. It would be fantastic to see that scaled um, much more widely across uh, across the globe. So these to really help reduce the need for plastic packaging in the first place. When we do need plastic packaging, then it's about avoiding virgin plastics. And that's where the RPET comes in as, as part of the solution. Um, and then finally, where we do need virgin plastics, uh, hopefully as minimal as possible, they're over time shifting to renewable bio-based feedstocks for these, um, you know, obviously in, in a way that, that, is, that is regenerative um, and not depleting our, our ecosystems. But, but, but that's... Um, kind of the, the, the order of things as, as you want to approach that decoupling from fossil fuel feedstocks. Thank you very much, Sander. I'm now going to bring in our, our next person who wants to speak, and that's Magaswara, who is going to uh, ask a question. I think it, she's going to be linking into something that's a critically important thing. We're talking about global trading here. We're talking about moving large amounts of plastic in big boats around the world. A lot of it used to be exported to developing countries, a lot less since, as Hans mentioned in 2017, China stopped uh, taking it. But it isn't just the good people 
who are involved in sending official ships. There is, at all levels of the waste management cycle in Europe and beyond, there are criminals involved in it, illegal waste shipment. And this is a clear, clear issue that we may have all the rules in the world, but this stuff is still needs to be moved around, and there are people who are getting around those rules. So, Magaswar, would you like to just unmute yourself and pose your question, please? That's it. Go ahead, Magaswara. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Malaysia, and um, uh, uh, from 2019 to 2020, we had seen a flood of uh, waste coming from um, the Europe. And then since the plastic waste amendments of the Basel Convention came into effect on uh, 1st of January, we have not um, um, monitored yet because we don't have the data from the customs yet. Uh, so we would like to know how is uh, EU going to actually uh, track and um, tackle the issue of illegal waste trade because we have seen from the Interpol report that organized crime is also involved in this waste trade. Yeah, and then also uh, there are still some loopholes uh, in the Basel Convention, uh, plastic waste amendments. So how uh, is EU going to tackle that issue? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. These are great questions. And I think, Maria, I'm going to come to you in the European Parliament because this is an issue that looks more broadly at how Europe tackles its role in some of these global uh, networks, some of which are legal and are controlled and checked and others which are illegal. Uh, and there we need to be working on enforcement. And how is the EU going to be looking at the loopholes in the Basel Convention? Maria, unmute yourself. Yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that, uh, of course, we we'll have, first of all, to look for the alliances. And in, in this regard, it is, it is very important to coordinate our action with uh, the US uh, when it comes to the implementation and addressing the targets of Paris Agreement, including the way that we are facing the issue of, of plastic and uh, specifically single-use plastic. It is also important to update our legal framework in order to, to not only to, to reach our targets, but also to, 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 to send a, a strict and clear message, or to, especially to, to, the packaging, uh, to the packaging industry and uh, to, to the packaging waste management. But I think that the most important issue for me, and allow me to say, is the way that we can create a global uh, treaty uh, taking uh, on board all stakeholders. And in this regard, I would like to give some kind of, uh, of numbers. For example, today's design technologies and system could only lead to 53% of plastic packaging in Europe to be recycling, to be eco-friendly. But if we replace just one-fifth of single-use plastic packaging with reusable alternatives globally, there is a material opportunity to save about 6 million tons of material and to worth at least 10 billion US dollars. Having said that, I would like to say that we have also to increase the profitability of this kind of action. We have to give incentives to the industry. We have to give incentives to all stakeholders that they are involved in this regard. Okay, thank you. Let me bring in Hans again from the European Environment Agency. And you may want to touch on yes, some of the I, questions earlier, but also this particular yeah. issue around illegal and legal waste. You know, how do you manage that? Yeah, well, I, I would like to focus on uh, part of the question that was asked that spoke about data. We like data and information. Well, I would almost say by definition, we like data when it's illegal. So there are other means to, to address that and the loopholes in legislation, that, that is not for us. But as an agency, we are focusing on analyzing and monitoring and reporting. And it is fair to say that in this whole debate, we lack fundamental data. Yeah? And if we want to indeed work with the producers, and if they tell us, like uh, I think uh, David Carroll told us, trust us, we understand. And, and Maria said we need to support them, and that's all fine. But trust comes with transparency. And I think uh, this is an area where we, we need more transparent data. So I would call on those who make the legislation to come with stricter sort of uh, parts of the legislation that disclose data. We For writing the report, we actually had problems getting fundamental data from the producer's site. And this, this is not OK, because as a society, we are dealing with the collective uh, problems 
uh, on, on climate, on, on environment, on our health, we are collectively feeling responsibility to deal with them in, a, in different levels. But we need transparency when it comes to basic data, because that is part of monitoring, reporting and verification that is absolutely needed. And there are uh, analogies. I mean, we had the similar issue with the agricultural data, which is now much more disclosed, undisclosed. And so I would call as somebody leading an agency that is based on data and analysis to take this as a serious issue, because without that transparency, there is no trust in the system. Okay. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. I'm now going to bring in somebody else to, to ask a question. Uh, Joost, Joost Dietkrist, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And thanks a lot to all the speakers. It's been a really, really inspiring, very energetic uh, talk. So I'm very happy to, uh, to be able to listen to it and to participate. Um, so I wanted to come back um, to um, the speaker. Um, sorry, I forgot the name from the European Commission. I'm very sorry. Sara from the European Commission. Sarah. Yeah, great. Um, you outlined the quite impressive range of initiatives, right? That uh, through the use, uh, through the single-use plastic legislation, will come in force. And um, of course, at the same time, the, the the plastic challenge is also a global problem, right? And uh, so now what I'm wondering, indeed, the, the EU is a very big, ma big market for consumption of plastics, and it's great if we make great progress in the EU. However, then there's also, um, of course, the Chinese market, which is, I think, equally big, or perhaps by now even a little bit bigger, and also the US. And then there's also very large markets in emerging economies. Uh, so I'm wondering about your strategy in terms of um, the Commission's strategy in terms of how to get similar initiatives on the way in these countries and regions. And um, of course, I mean, one in, in particular, I would like to hear if you think it, it, it might be worthwhile going for a global agreement and uh, and thus trying to, to bring these um, initiatives to a, not, not to a lowest common denominator, but to a highest common denominator. Um, or would you say it's more bilateral negotiations that could help to convince, for example, China to uh, to adopt similar initiatives? So, I would okay. be quite curious to hear those, uh, some answers to that. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Jos. And, and so this is a question for, for Sara. And here we, here's a question. What's the best way to get other parts of the world involved? Should we do bilateral, working individually with big players like Brazil or with China or with India? Or do we try and do it multilaterally? How do we ensure that other parts of the world where their, their use of, of plastic is likely to be growing, you know, we can support and get global action? Because as we've heard, it's a global problem. Sara. Absolutely. And uh, it's not one or the other. We do all of this together in our relations with um, individual third countries. Circular economy is part of the dialogue for quite a while already. And it's not just um, if we go to Africa, it's not just uh, DG Development uh, Corporation who is in charge. Um, DG Environment in the past years had had circular economy missions at the high level of the director general to many of the countries that, that you have mentioned, uh, to Brazil, to India, to Iran, to a lot of African countries, um, also to well, present what we do, but also to see how they can try to see the economic logic and what's in it for them to make sure that we move in a different uh, direction. And of course, marine pollution in many of the countries, uh, more than in uh, in Europe even, is, is, is a huge challenge. And the openness to discuss on plastic uh, has been through this element, uh, one, of the, one of the openers actually. Uh, but at the same time, I think all of these efforts um, and the work and the example that Europe has been uh, putting forward, because I think the plastic strategy of 2018 is a comprehensive one and, and uh, quite uh, unique in the world. Um, all of this uh, leads to the fact that Europe has been an enabling factor in the uh, willingness to go for a global um, a global solution and a treaty. And this uh, hopefully will materialize, especially with the new dimension, uh, the new push that can also come from uh, the US now. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in one last question, and that's Andres Del Castillo. Would you like to unmute yourself and share your question? 
Yes, thank you so much for organizing this and putting this uh, really uh, good event uh, together. I'm senior attorney for the Center for International Environmental Law, member of the organization uh, Very Free From Plastic. Uh, and we are glad to see at the EE report 18 uh, that they make uh, many reference to our report of 2019 on climate and uh, how the report also emphasize of the life cycle approach. Uh, I have a brief question related to the link on climate change and biodiversity and looking at the draft report at the European Parliament um, on biodiversity strategy for 2030, there is a call there for the Parliament, for the Union to lead the negotiations association for a treaty uh, on plastics. And the good things, the good news is that uh, the call is ambitious, is for uh, stop the leaking in the, into the ocean to 2030. This is a good global uh, uh, ambition. Uh, the bad thing is like, is limit to ocean marine litter. And my question is about what are the next steps for this year, for example, uh, for the European Union, on this regard, how they are going to keep that momentum towards UNIA 5.2, where the discussion will happen on the treaty or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think I'll come to you, Maria, there, because it's a, in response to a call from the European Parliament to that the Europe should take a lead in global negotiations looking at plastics. And we've had a, a question, you know, why, st why limit it to just ocean and marine? Why not go further and be more ambitious? Maria, do you want to respond on that? Yes, because first, uh, one step at a time, and we have to face the issue which is concentrated on, on the marine litter in oceans. And as we have already said, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight, as we all know. So we have to tackle this thing, and of course we are ambitious. We are uh, talking about giving 10% uh, of our resources from multilateral financial framework to, to, to maintain biodiversity. And it is important to, to take into account that the, the, this is a part of our broader, uh, broader scope for, for, for keeping nature uh, alive. But uh, allow me to say, uh, by putting very, very ambitious target. It does not mean that we can address them. And it is important to address our targets. So, uh, and thank you for, for bringing us back to a point of reality there, that it's all well and good to set political targets, but then they have to be met. You have to implement, you have to set the processes, the data in place to make sure that they are more than just a, a piece of paper. We're coming towards the end of our time together, so I'm going to go back to each of the members of our panel and invite them to think about one big idea about where they think Europe could go next, what we should do next. And we've had lots of things that have come forward in our conversation. We've had a call for better data, requirements for all members of the, the value chain to share their data so we can understand more of what's happening. We've had a call for more ambitious targets. We've had a call for tracking waste, in particular illegal waste that is being uh, delivered from Europe and exported to other parts of the world. We've had a call for there to be a sort of rethink about you know the the way that chemicals are used we've had a call for a focus on renewable plastics keeping out of the environment so lots of potential topics here members of the panel and I'm going to go in our speaking order so I'm going to start with hands what's your one big idea for what Europe should do on this issue of the new plastics economy it all starts with molecules so the chemical strategy is the key. It's uh, safe and sustainable by design. That is the basis. It's all about molecules. OK, molecules and, and safe by design. Let me come to you, Maria. What's your one big idea of where you think the EU should have real impact and move next? For me? Yes, you've gone on mute again. OK. That's it. For me, the main, the main issue is how can we increase the involvement of the people. For me, it is all about people. We have to start uh, raising awareness further. We have to engage uh, students. We have to, to, to change the consumer model. And since we finally succeeded, then we can address the, the, the target of uh, reducing uh, of use of single-use plastic. Thank you. Um, let me now go to Sander. What's your big, big idea about what Europe should be doing next? 
Yeah, I think we, we've seen working with 100 companies around the world, we've seen over the past year a shift from focusing on waste management and downstream solutions only more to focus on design. I think the next big step is understanding that design is much, much bigger. The solution space is much bigger than just design for recycling and, and designing to use recycled content and need to go beyond seeing this as a packaging challenge and how do I redesign my packaging to also think about how do I redesign my product itself? How do I redesign entire business models? That's an enormously unexplored innovation opportunity um, that, uh, yeah, that should urgently be explored uh, to solve this issue. Thank you. Sara, where do you think we could make big progress at EU? Well, I think we have to think more about how to reduce and reuse our materials. And then I can only concur with previous speakers that uh, rethinking the design of what we put there is, is crucial. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to our speakers for giving us lots of insight. And to you, the audience, for participating so actly, actively. The chat has had lots of useful engagement. And we'll make sure that the links and other things that you put in the chat are shared more widely. And you, you'll see this, report, this video will be available on the Friends of Europe website, so you can listen again, watch again, and share it. I began our, our hour together by saying, you know, our universe has existed for billions of years, and yet in the last hundred years, we have turned it into a plastic world, a world that we're exposed to pre-birth and we are surrounded by. But that is within our power to change, and we've heard examples today of different ways that people have moved forward to rethinking, uh, redesigning. We've got challenges about where to go next. We've got issues that are, are still at the heart of our economy, and I, I mentioned just the, the, the pandemic, which has resulted in an enormous amount of plastic being used for single-use protective equipment that we're going to have to get to grips with as a society, how we deal with it. We also, I mean, one issue that came up again was the issue of tobacco and cigarettes. The vast majority of what is being found in the sea is cigarette butts. It's the largest single amount of litter that you find. It's in entirely toxic in times in our groundwater. So it's in our rivers and our ponds and in our streets. So and this is a battle we've been working on for 40 years. And now we're having to bring that into the plastics debate, which just tells me that everything is connected, whether it's our food system, whether it's our clothes, it's the products we use in our lives. It's all connected. And we've, we've heard the final message that we need to look at molecules. So we need to use our chemistry and our innovation. Maria said we need to bring in populations and people awareness because the change has got to be one where people want the change to happen, where they see the impact in their lives and they move forward. We've heard about changing not just packaging, but design of products much further upstream. And this is part of the new vision that societies and people need to be part of. What kind of products do they want in their lives and how do we design them in the way that has the least impact on our environment? I want to say a warm thank you to all of you for participating. It's been a really exciting and lively debate. Join us again on Friends of Europe for upcoming debates that you'll find details of on our website. You'll also be able to find other activities and publications, so please follow us on Twitter. Thank you all. Stay safe. Goodbye, and see you again soon.